hello. Oh, it's so nice to see all of you. I love Brooklyn. I just, it's so amazing. It's like, uh, wait, why am I feeding back? Am I like a, all right. Uh, <laughs> am I turning into an instrument? Like turning into a guitar? Uh, so uh, I just want to say uh, the New York I used to know is here now. And when I, I just love, I love it. I love all of you. And I, I just, the feeling of this is incredible. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to do something unusual. I've been on book tour, like in Europe, and you talk about the book, and you take questions, you talk about the book. Oh, it's a New York street town. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh. I used to, when I used to live, I live in California, and I have, what is going on with this? I used, I, I've lived in California. Um, I mean, how close do you want me to be? Anyway, um, I, I used to live in Tribeca. I haven't for, uh, I've lived in California for almost two decades. But, you know, when you live right next to a noisy street, the sounds of the street, the garbage trucks and the people yelling and all that stuff, they become your dream creatures. So, like, there are these, there are these wonderful dream dinosaur flying crazy things that only come back to me when I'm sleeping in New York and there's a garbage truck outside. That's the only time I meet them now. <laughs> So it's like old friends in my psyche. Anyway, all right. We are going to start with a welcome music piece. Then I'm going to give a book talk. Then we're going to do a little more music. Then I'm going to do questions. And then in, in between questions, we'll do little pieces. And then we'll do a conclusion piece of music after the questions. Sound reasonable? <laughs>
Okay, so I don't know if we can cut the instrument mic well. All right, so let me introduce the musicians. These are all uh, musicians from the amazing Brooklyn Orchestra, The Knights, right? <laughs> One of my favorite ensembles on the planet, Sean Conley. He's uh, playing the mainframe over there. And then <laughs> my... <laughs> Michael uh, Caristano on percussion. And Eric Jacobson on the mini computer. Which is actually what cello meant once upon a time. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna ask my esteemed musical partners to uh, wait. Um, off to the side, I will give you a book talk. Um, and then we will proceed as I described. Maybe I'll sit on this stool. I don't know where the stool came from, but I like the idea. Oh, wait. All right. I like the sitting thing because it feels more like I'm on your level instead of like the professor, you know, dictating. Okay. As you must have noticed by now, I have this new book called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Why would I ask you to do that? Those of you who have them are probably addicted, and it's about as useful to tell you to do that as it is to say, stop that gambling, <laughs> it's bad for you. I mean, like, if you're addicted, you're addicted. And even if you're not addicted, Companies like Facebook have what we call a network effect lock, where everybody's on them because everybody else is on them, and there's no way to go, nowhere else to go, and there's no way we could all coordinate to leave at once, so we're kind of stuck there. That's true, too. So why the hell am I asking you to do something that very few of you will do? The reason why is if even a few of you do it, I think that would be so important that it might make the difference about whether our species survives or not. That's why. All right? Does that sound like an exaggerated or alarmist idea? It shouldn't. It's, it's real. So let me go over a little bit why I think this is so important. Now, a good place to start, <laughs> since this is a science-related venue, I'm going to take a bit of a science lecture approach to it, but only light. I'm not going to go into deep here. Um, there's this stream of scientific work called behaviorism, right? Behaviorism goes back to the 19th century. It is a subdiscipline in which you attempt to change the behavior patterns of a creature might be an animal, might be a person, and you do it methodically. You do it algorithmically. You observe what the creature does. You give the creature fine-tuned experiences in, what, in response to what the creature does, and thereby you get the creature to change. This is distinct from the way animals and little children were trained before, although we always used reward and punishment with babies from the earliest days, I'm sure, but we used to whisper in the ear of the horse. We used to cuddle the baby. There used to be this other level of intuitive connection. Behaviorism said, no, we want to cut that stuff off, reduce the variables. A famous behaviorist named B.F. Skinner proposed a formal way of doing this called the Skinner box. Everybody's heard of this, right? It's a, the idea is that you create a controlled experimental environment where you can stick the rat or the person, whatever, the prisoner, whoever it is, and they, have, they don't have a lot of random stimuli. They are, they are in this environment where you can control what happens to them. Uh, the stimuli in the science of behaviorism was typically divided into reward and punishment or positive and negative feedback. Typical examples from the 20th century would be candy as reward and an electric shock for punishment. There was a very strange sociological phenomenon that overtook the pioneers of behaviorism. They became celebrities through their creepiness. 
it's really peculiar. Like, um, uh, you had famous behaviorists doing things like proving they could take a young human child and make him fear animals forever by making them, you know, just conditioning them to fear animals. Can you imagine such a thing? But that was like a celebrated public experiment. B.F. Skinner of the box uh, was one of the first people ever to experiment with user experiences over a digital network. And he wanted to use digital networks to condition society to transcend idiosyncrasy, to transcend weird, fallacious ideas about freedom and whatever. He, he was really creepy. Um, and he was there before almost anyone in networks. Now, it's a funny thing about behaviorism. Uh, the first time it crossed paths with the idea of computing was really early in the history of computing. And it was through a figure named Norbert Wiener. How many people here know about Norbert Wiener? Yeah, he deserves a round of applause for sure. So, <laughs> Norbert Wiener was one of the very earliest computer scientists. He was in that first generation when the ideas that had been formalized by Alan Turing and then shortly thereafter with Turing and von Neumann working together, when these were still fresh when the only working computers were these giant noisy things that were fantastically expensive. He was there and he did a few really interesting things. One thing he did is he became interested in turning around the way Turing thought about computers. The way Turing initially described computers was as like this three-stage process. There'd be this starting stage where you'd put punch holes in a paper tape or something like that in the, in the imagination of the day. You'd have this, these bits that you set, you put them through the machine, then the machine does whatever it does, and it either stops or not, and if it stops at the end, you have another set, uh, another tape with holes in it. You have another set of bits. So there's start state, run the thing, and if you're lucky and you get an answer, you get an answer, and that's it. Uh, when, when Norbert Wiener looked at this, he said, you know, there's this completely different way you can think about the same ideas, which is that the computer would be on all the time. It would be sensing the world, and then it would be responding to the world, kind of like a thermostat. A thermostat has a thermometer, but then it can also control a heater, or in some lucky cases, an air conditioner. And he said, what if, what if we instead thought of a computer as a really complicated thermometer with a bunch of memory and, and algorithms? And, and so this is, he came up with a term for this conception, and it's cybernetics. So cyber comes from the Greek, and it's to navigate. It's navigating a boat. And so the idea is that in this concept, the computer is navigating reality. It's seeing where reality has drifted, and then it gets reality back to where it wants reality to go. So that's cybernetics. And there's an amazing book that Turing wrote. I mean, no, no, not Turing. This is Norbert Wiener wrote uh, in probably starting in the late 40s. It was published a little later, but it still way predates anything about networking. It's like super early. One of the very earliest descriptions of the idea of networking computers that ever existed. And he says, what if you have a computer that's watching a human being? It's measuring how the human being moves. It measures the sounds that come out of the human being. It measures where the human being looks, whatever can be measured. And then it provides some kind of stimulus, maybe images, maybe sounds. Couldn't a computer that's able to measure a person and give feedback gradually start to control a person just like one of the dogs or rats in Mr. Skinner's boxes? Couldn't the computer become an automated behaviorist? And, he's, and then he says, if it's not clear to you why I think this is a terrifying idea, I want to give you a thought experiment. And here's his thought experiment. And this is right at the end of a book called The Human Use of Human Beings. And right at the end of it, he says, imagine that someday everybody in the world could carry a little computer. I know, I know it's impossible, but just imagine Someday they could do that. And imagine, furthermore, that these little 
computers that are attached to people can measure a lot of things about the people. They measure who they talk to, where they look. They measure all kinds of stuff about them. And they can also give them feedback. They can show them images. They can show them text. They can play them sounds. Now imagine something even more incredible and fantastic. Imagine they're connected by little radios to a central really big computer. And over the radio signal, the really big computer is doing calculations that are simulating what a behaviorist does to modify the people. And then there's somebody somewhere who's able to then gradually modify people. Now the interesting thing about being the subject of behavior modification loops is that you don't know it's happening to you. It used to happen in a lot of very isolated circumstances. It happened in the psychology experiments of the behaviorists, of course. Some of you might have been lured into the basement of the psych building on a campus with the promise of a free slice of pizza or something, and you might have been subject to some behaviorist experiments to help some undergraduates or something like that. Sometimes it's used by interrogators. So if you're on the wrong side of the desk in an interrogation room, it's used by cult leaders. It's used by members of the pickup artist movement, although that's probably bullshit. Oh, sorry, I'm on, t sorry C-SPAN, I apologize for that. Um, yeah, we're on TV, if you didn't know, this is, I really apologize, but our president does it, you know, what am I supposed to do? Uh, I really hate to sound presidential these days, and I'm afraid I did for a moment. Anyway, uh, so, uh, it happened in abusive relationships, even though they, the, peop the abuser didn't realize that that's what was going on, but it was very isolated. Um, and what, what <laughs> Norbert Wiener says is, if the whole world could be put under this kind of regime of behavior modification at once through the central computer, he concludes it would be mass insanity. He says this would be the end of the species. But then he has this very comforting conclusion. He says, as one of the most prominent scientists of the era, I just want to comfort you and assure you that this thought experiment could never be realized. It's infeasible that there could be such a giant central computer. It's infeasible that there could be all those radio connections. It's infeasible that there could be some small device that would do this. And um, so, <laughs> need I say, in this particular case, he was a little optimistic or pessimistic, depending on your point of view. Of course, it's exactly what we've done. We all are carrying around these devices. They all attach by radios to central computer. But here's the craziest thing, the craziest thing in the world, is we've set up this bizarre system where anytime two people use this wonderful thing that so many of us worked so hard to bring about, which we call the internet, anytime two people connect by it, that connection is almost universally financed because there's a third party who believes they can use behaviorist techniques to manipulate the first two people without them understanding what's going on. We've created this society based on universal trickery and deception. And it's an astonishing hole we've dug ourselves into. We've created a, so a society where we can't trust election results. We've created a society where we kind of routinely expect to be bullied and harassed and made to feel terrible. We've created a society in which most people kind of don't believe in truth anymore. Which, and I mean, this is nuts. This is a form of mass suicide, and we're in the middle of doing it right now. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about how it works. I want to tell you a little bit more about how it came to be. And I want to tell you a little bit more about how you can get out of it and why you must. Or at least those few of you who I hope to reach today, because I know I won't reach most of you. Maybe I'll proceed with a bit of the story of how we got to this in the first place, because it's just so bizarre. What happened was, back in the 80s and 90s, there was this really strong movement in the culture of digital technology uh, to make everything free and open. This was the open software movement, free software. This was, uh, let's make music free, let's make culture open. Uh, design like the Wikipedia is an expression of that time. It was a movement based on the most beautiful ideas and it was promoted by beautiful people with tremendous sincerity. 
at the same time that that was happening, there was this other countervailing idea that was also becoming more and more powerful. And that was this idea that there were certain special people and these people might have been the super hackers, or they might have been the super tech entrepreneurs, the Steve Jobses, let's say. And these people, because they could hack so well, because they were so good at computer stuff, they could change the course of history. They could, uh, the way Jobs put it, he said, you could dent the universe. So it's like this Nietzschean magic. We are the magic people, we're the superheroes. And everybody really believed that. People really loved their hacker heroes. They loved figures like Steve Jobs. And so here you have this problem. You're saying, we have these super people, and a lot of them are entrepreneurs, but then you want everything to be free. Super entrepreneur, free. How do you get those two things to reconcile? And it's sort of like this extreme socialism with this extreme libertarianism. Where's the meeting point? So they meet at one point. Nobody's ever articulated another point where they meet, and that one point is what we call the advertising model. So the idea is that services like Google and Facebook were born where the surface experience for the people using them was like the Wikipedia. It's all about connecting, it's about community, it's free. You share, you do these things and it's beautiful. And yet, there was also this giant business and indeed, these companies became the fastest growing ones with the biggest fortunes. And right now, you know, the biggest companies in the world are all these types of data-driven cyber behemoths. Um, and <laughs> before I go any further, I should make it clear that my perspective here is not, oh, these horrible big corporations. I actually kind of love them. I'm part of them. Uh, sold a company to Google very early on. Um, and know a lot of people there have friends at Facebook. So I don't think vilification of the people at these companies or of the companies is the right way to proceed. Um, I think the right way to proceed is to get them to change, but I'll get to that a little later. So uh, we had this bizarre solution to this conflict between the profoundly felt desire for a kind of an open everything is somewhere between socialism and anarchy and then uh, this other sort of hyper-libertarian thing. We wanted them to coexist. So as I say, for the users, it's this open, open, share, 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 but then behind the scenes is something else again. So behind the scenes what's going on is, is truly um, perverse and infuriating, but because it's behind the scenes, you don't see it a lot. Um, I've had occasion to be present when uh, the big companies court big, what are called advertising accounts. I hate the term advertising for this because if you're constantly measuring the person and adjusting to fine tune, to find a way to manipulate the person without the person knowing, that's not advertising, that's behavior modification. That's manipulation. We can't use the language of advertising. Uh, but anyway, we do. I, but so I'll just call, I'll call the advertisers from here on the manipulators, and I'll call, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to call the companies behavior modification empires. Is that okay with you? All right, because I just think it's more descriptive. And instead of the term engagement, I'm going to use the term addiction. And, and I'm not saying some radical out there thing in saying this. Uh, a whole series of the earliest uh, top executives of Facebook have come out and regrettably said, yes, we use ad ad addictive techniques deliberately. I mean, this is out in the open. There's not, I'm not making some radical hypothesis here. All right, anyway, when the companies are selling themselves to their customers, the manipulators, they are really kind of creepy. They'll say, oh, yeah, 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 we can target a group of people and change how they think and change what they do. And... It's important to understand the power of the system. It can't target you and then with a high degree of accuracy say, I'm gonna change you. It's this broad statistical thing. What it can do is it can target two million people and say, I'll get 3% of them to change by 5%. It's, it's small. The changes that are reliable are small because they're very distributed, they're very statistical. And you might say, oh, who cares? We're getting free services for just these tiny shades of difference. But the thing is, reliable, tiny shades of difference, carefully applied, consistently, have a compounding effect. It's like compound interest. You can only do a little bit at a time, but over time, you can accumulate quite a significant effect. You can turn elections. You can disrupt a society. 
you can make things pretty ugly. Now here we get to a very interesting question, which is, I'm talking about the effect of these slight changes. And oh, by the way, I just want, the reason I was talking about when they pitch is when the companies pitch, they're incredibly arrogant about how they can reliably change all of you. And yet out in public, they'll say, oh no, we can't really do very much. It's very, very slight. And the thing is, both points, both, both the sort of meek and, and modest portrayal and then the arrogant portrayal are kind of true because it is cumulative. It just depends on, on the frame you're looking at. So here's an interesting thing. Let's say at this point you might be thinking, well, if these systems can be used to modify people, why is it that they seem to be making the world sadder, crankier, more divisive? They seem to be destroying people's ability to perceive truth. They seem to be destroying people's ability to act in their own self-interest. They're disruptive of societies. They're igniting ethnic hatred. They're throwing elections. They're, may be, they're making people distrust their democracies. Now, everything I just said, you might say, prove it, prove it. Is that true? You know, <laughs> it's a thing, it's very similar to the problem of, of climate change. It's very hard to prove a particular storm or a particular flood is climate change related, but you can look at the overall uh, rate of them and you can say, well, that corresponds to climate change. Just as with this, there's a large body of research tracking things like likelihood of teen suicide, tracking social media use, and a zillion, in the book, it's filled with footnotes of all kinds of different studies. There's a broad pattern. Is it absolutely definitive? Just as with climate change, for the true skeptic, it can never be. It's a correlative argument. I think we're at the point where we have to, we have no reasonable choice other than to accept that what I, the list of, of uh, accusations I just gave are supported. But I'll leave that to the book and you can chase down the footnotes if you're skeptical. But let me get back to a question, which is that I, I suspect some of you have in your head. And that question is, okay, let's say I buy this. Let's say I buy that this behind the scenes machine is churning, manipulating people, and it's doing all this damage in the world. Why should it be doing damage instead of good? And here, I wanna give you a little bit of insight into how we've screwed ourselves over with the system. And this is something that I'm absolutely certain nobody foresaw. I'm absolutely certain that this is an innocent mistake, even though it's a rather grave and large scale mistake. Um, I mean, there's a funny thing going on, like uh, um, some of the early Facebook people, uh, like Sean Parker, are kind of recalling themselves as being more like Bond villains than I think they really were. Like he's saying, oh yeah, we knowingly did all this addictive stuff. I kind of knew him at the time, and I, I think they actually fell into it more innocently, and maybe there's a certain glamour in imagining yourself as a Bond villain. But anyway, this stuff I'm sure, I'm sure they were not Bond villains. I'm sure this was innocent. So here's how it goes. The algorithms, remember, behaviorism is based on a feedback loop. Your behavior is measured, such as did you actually buy this thing that you saw an ad for, or did you click through, or did you just spend more time on the system and be more engaged, which is a prime driver that the algorithms are trying to optimize for. Did you do all that stuff or not? And then it might give you a treat or punishment. Now, so far, we don't have little drones floating over us that drop actual can candy or <laughs> shock us with electric shocks, right? So instead, the positivity and the negativity that form the addictive cycle and the behavior modification loop are social experiences, which are incredibly deep and powerful for people. So the positive ones are more rare than the negative ones, and this is always true in addictive cycles. When the gambler is addicted, it's not to winning, but it's to the whole cycle where they lose more often. People with chemical addictions are addicted to a cycle in which they're more often in pain or down than they are having a high. This is a universal character of addiction. So every once in a while, the terminology preferred in Silicon Valley is oversimplified, but it's like, oh, we'll give you your dopamine hit. And the dopamine hit is when you get retweeted or something, something that validates you happens. But then in between that is an, a, a longer and unpredictable period in which you're either ignored or overshadowed or harassed or ridiculed or whatever the hell it is. There's always some kind of negativity in between the dopamine hits. Now, this, the, the algorithms 
are measuring you at a fast frequency. They're, they're, they're every single time you do anything, and these days, because even motion is counted and facial expressions, if you're looking at the camera, this might be a very fast sampling indeed because your behavior can change right, quite rapidly. So with this fast sampling, it'll capture those emotional responses which rise the fastest in you. Now, here's an interesting thing. If you ask what kind of responses rise fast, it's true that there are a few sort of pleasant ones, and that's the dopamine hit. But there's a far larger number of negative ones that rise faster. And these include startle responses and becoming scared, becoming angry. And these things happen, they rise fast, and then they decay slowly, kind of like a string on an instrument. They go up fast, and then they take a long time to die down. Ah, this is a good sound. Do you hear the siren of the police car? I love how New York police cars kind of talk. There's no other city in the world that's like, you know, there might be a problem here, there might be a problem here, there might be a problem here. <laughs> Pay attention. It's like, it's like it has like intent, it's amazing. There's like this language. Um, so, uh, <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> um, but that sound, that, that siren, it's not like this, instant on and then it decays. It's like it goes up. Now, the interesting thing is that most positive reactions, such as like gaining admiration, gaining understanding, gaining appreciation, gaining trust, these things build more slowly, but they can be killed very quickly. And so if you have a system that's measuring you on a very rapid basis and then giving you feedback, which bundle of emotions is it gonna pick up on in order to try to engage you more. Why the negative ones? Because more of them are fast rising. And so there's a weird thing where if you look at <laughs> people, if you, there's a huge body of uh, published ex of work where, where experimenters have tried to determine if positive or negative or reward or punishment feedback is more influential. And the results are a fascinating patchwork that depends on the circumstance and the nature of the subject and all kinds of things. Overall, there's a parity. Overall, they're about a balance. But if you measure in this way quickly, you highlight more negative ones. And so therefore, there's this totally unintended result that if there's somebody who wants to either be a paying customer of a service like Facebook or just manipulate their way through it with the way they post on it, either way, they get more bang for their buck when they're negative. So it's naturally a negativity machine because of the timing of the feedback loop. It's a little bit like the problems that sometimes come up with high frequency trading, where those things can be more prone to certain kinds of illusions in markets. And I don't want to get into a big technical thing about that, but it is true that, uh, for instance, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Donald Trump's social media director for the presidential campaign reported um, and Facebook disputes this, but this is what he says. He's the customer. Customers are always right, remember. And he says that when they put up a negative ad that was particularly aimed at sort of crankiness, well, these are my words, not his, but you know, these sort of cranky paranoia ads um, and racist and whatever, that they would get a giant multiple, maybe hundreds of times more exposure to people than when Hillary spent the same amount of money for an ad that was tamer because the algorithms reward and amplify things that cause engagement addiction. So negativity just happens to work. It happens to get amplified. Nobody designed it that way. But as long as that's the system we have and that's this thing that connects us all, the way most people get news, the way most people know their own family and friends, the way most people search for work, so many things like this. It's this giant invitation, this giant red carpet for the society to manip be manipulated by bad actors like the Russian intelligence warfare units that threw our last election. I didn't say this until recently, I used to say that might have, but since James Clapper, the retired head of national security is saying it begs credulity not to say they threw the election, I figure, okay, finally, let's just say it. They threw the election. And the thing is, if let's suppose hypothetically that the tooth fairy visited Vladimir Putin and he suddenly got this vision, oh, I want to make the world harmonious and good and I don't care about my own power and a healthy world is good for Russia and I'm not going to be creepy anymore, I repent. And then 
He's, and then he calls up his people and he says, can you help the United States heal instead of disrupting it more? And they'll say, well, Vladimir, I mean, we could, <laughs> we could do this thing, but it would cost 10, 000, you know, 10,000 times more. It's like we're getting this multiplier for disruption. And he would say, oh my God, it would be that expensive. Okay, stay creepy, you know, because <laughs> creepiness is the bargain way to use this stuff. And so <laughs> there's, there, there are many <laughs> effects of this which are, which are heartbreaking. Um, an example is um, the Arab Spring was so celebrated and celebrated in such an arrogant way in Silicon Valley. We called it the Facebook revolution, the Twitter revolution, even though of course we weren't there, it was somebody else's revolution, but we claimed it. And the thing is though that even though, as with so many other things about social media, the initial benefits that you perceive are authentic, they're not unreal at all, Behind the scenes, the manipulation machine is running and what it does is it finds the people who are the most engaged, the most emotionally aroused by whatever is going on. And of course, those are the people with the negative emotions. They're introduced to each other. The cycle that gets them excited is more and more emphasized and more and more refined. And then the result down the road is that an organization like ISIS gets even more power from the same tools than the Arab Spring did. Or an example close to home, Black Lives Matter starts off, in my opinion, as a beautiful movement, articulate, generous, forgiving, but the algorithms are searching out those people who are upset by it because upset, impulse is what is captured more than consideration. And those impulsive people are the negative ones for the most part. Once again, this is all statistically, it's not perfect, it's just percentages. These negative people are introduced to each other. Their cycle of negativity is amplified, amplified, amplified because the algorithms are trying to drive engagement, engagement, engagement. And then you have a resurgent KKK and neo-Nazi movement that we haven't seen in generations. So what starts off as po uh, positivity is turned into something I can't say on C-SPAN like clockwork, over and over again. And then people still say, well, we'll use social media to try to fight all the madness that's come about in the social media era, but you can't, you can't. So in order for us to not drive ourselves to, in, to extinction, and I, and I say extinction because we have real problems. We as a species have to find a way to be sane right now. We have to face up to climate change. We have to face up to how we're gonna support a growing population, which is still not peaked. We have to face up to how we're gonna deal with weapons of mass destruction. We're gonna have to deal with uh, the need for advanced medicine because we're not controlling all of the disease vectors that exist that could explode. I mean, this is real stuff. This is our future survival. And on all counts, we're, we're going nuts instead. I sometimes joke, <laughs> do you know what toxoplasmosis is? It, it's this parasite, if you've ever been pregnant or known somebody who is, they'll say, oh, don't get around pat, cat poop because cat poop might have this parasite. And so the cats have this parasite, they poop it, and then it gets into the diet of rodents. And then the parasite enters the rodent brain and modifies it so that it's less afraid of cats, so the cats have more to eat. And then they have more to poop. Right? So that's the life cycle of the talk. And to me, um, Facebook is toxoplasmosis. <laughs> the internet's the cat, you're the mouse. All right? So what happens is, um, as a matter of course, this, this machine, this manipulative machine, kind of undoes those who would criticize it. As a matter of course, somehow or other, it disrupts the US. It's bringing incredible challenges to the EU with nationalist movements and Brexit all being influenced by it. And it's brought about um, astonishing carnage in the developing world. I won't go into all of the instances. There's a lot in the book about that. But it's almost as if it's going out there and undoing the regulators who might otherwise address it. So to me, um, the only way 
to have a societal conversation about this is for there to be at least a minority of people who aren't in the middle of it who can talk about the world without seeing it through the lens of the daily hit of paranoia and craziness on Twitter and Facebook and the rest. There just has to be some number of people who have outgrown the, the, the remote control hypnosis. Now, um, I, <laughs> there's this, this is a huge topic and there's a lot to talk about. Um, in the book I go into a couple of other dimensions. I, I won't go into too much here. One is what should the companies do? Um, I think they've got to either choose socialism or capitalism. This, this unholy combination we have is the worst of both worlds. If they want to choose socialism, we could say the internet should be like the public library, and that could work. If they want to choose capitalism, we should say social media and search should be like Netflix. You pay for them. But they should also be kind of like Etsy or Patreon or something, where you can make your living from them instead of being put out of work by the AI robots that are supposedly going to do that. But that's a whole other topic. Uh, <laughs> The AI robots need your data, they can't work without your data, and yet they're gonna make you obsolete. That's not honest. You should be paid for your data so that we can all be motivated to make better data for better robots, and that could be a dignified society, actually. But let's leave that aside. Um, there's also what I call a spiritual problem, which is that when you use social media, you inherently buy into a whole philosophy of life and death that is probably not what you wanna believe. You start to believe that virality is truth. You start to believe that we already know how to quantify the value of communication and truth when we don't in many cases. You start to believe that certain kinds of activities are real and certain kinds aren't. Uh, if, you can, if you can get people excited and document things in a certain way, that adds validity. And all of these things are gradually building towards a new religion that places the big computers, that places like Facebook in the center of kind of your existence. Um, Facebook has said its new goal is to create meaning for every person in the world. Like that's the most arrogant thing you could say. Google used to come up with the creepiest stuff like well, we have a new project to end death. And I thought well that's kind of a creepy thing for a corporation to say. Facebook's actually surpassed them. And so if you have these algorithms creating your meaning, it means you're buying into a philosophy that we already know what meaning is in life and that we can write an algorithm for it. And that idea that we already live in a world that's been totally known, that where there aren't edges of infinity and unknowingness, to me is terribly sad. It feels to me like I can't breathe every time I even start to think that way. And yet everybody is kind of forcibly thinking that way, even in order to use these tools although only a little. Once again, it's statistical. You're being changed gradually. You're being gradually changed into a religious adherent to this new religion that maybe you'll live forever if you can be uploaded into a Google server or something like that. You don't quite believe that yet, but you're like being dragged there gradually, a little more, a little more, a little more. Whether you're a traditional religious person or some kind of wild Buddhist crazy person, or if you're like a hardcore atheist, no matter what belief you have, you're being dragged gradually into a much cruder and less valuable belief system by this. All of those are much better. Um, okay, so, um, so some of you, I don't know how many it'll take, 5%? If 5% of the society can have a conversation outside the manipulation machine, outside the addiction machine, you want to know if you're addicted? Um, there's a personality effect. You start to get kind of weirdly irritable and a little paranoid. You start to kind of pick fights with people. It used to be called the poor little snowflake syndrome. You know that that's what conservatives call college students who have it. But you know the best example is Trump. Trump is addicted to Twitter and it makes him weirdly, I, I've talked to the guy over the years, over decades, and he's always been a con man. He's always been a showman. He's always, seemed a little mobbed up, you know, but he never used to be so weirdly insecure and so in need of picking a fight and so bizarrely irritable and sort of paranoid. That's new and that's his addiction talking. And if you see anything like that in yourself or a friend, for God's sakes, delete your accounts right there. When You don't even have to tell anybody. You don't have to admit it. Just do it for your own sake. <laughs> All right. This isn't anybody else's business. If you're young and you've grown up with this stuff, at least get away from it for a while. It's the modern equivalent of trekking in Nepal or something. You have to, 
you have to take some risks, endure a little bit of discomfort just in order to know yourself. You have to know yourself before you can even have an opinion about this stuff. Get off it for six months, and after that, you can go back on it if that's your choice, but then it's really your choice. It's not my choice. I don't know you, but until you at least test the waters of being free of the system, you don't know yourself. Uh, I love the Silicon Valley companies. I love Silicon Valley. It's my home. It's, I'm part of it. Um, I want it to thrive. I'm absolutely convinced that we must and can and will make this transition. A future version of Facebook might be like what's happened with Netflix. People used to say, we won't pay for TV. We'll make TV like the Wikipedia makes articles. It'll all be volunteer. There was an honest test between that and just paying for the stuff you want. And while I'm not saying Netflix is perfect or any of the other companies, they all deserve criticism in various ways and should be criticized in various ways, every single one of them. But Netflix did create this thing that a lot of people call peak TV. Someday we'll have peak social media. Someday we'll have peak search. This will be a form of search and social media that isn't completely stuffed to the gills with fake people and fake garbage and manipulative rankings and all this stuff. It'll, the motivation, the incentives have to be changed so that that kind of stuff isn't put at the absolute center of everything. So please, at least consider it, okay? Free yourself to free us all. That is the talk.